Hello and welcome to The Vital Blend. My name is Anthony Vita, and in today's episode, I'm gonna be introducing you to somebody truly unique, a one-of-a-kind kind of guy, and I don't say that about just anyone. You know, not only is my next guest living a whole food plant-based lifestyle, but he's been doing it his entire life, and he is now 70 years old. That's right, how many people do you know who are 70 years old who have never had pizza, hamburger, or hot dogs? And then again, how many 70-year-olds do you know that don't take pills, uh, they're not battling with high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity? Uh, Mark Huberman is the shining example of what it means to stack the dietary odds in your favor, to reap the many benefits of a whole food, plant-based lifestyle. And he lives by his motto, health is built, not bought. And it's a pleasure to welcome Mark Huberman. Welcome to The Vital Blend. It is a pleasure to have you here. Anthony, it's nice to finally connect. It is, it is. Uh, it's, you, you have such an amazing story uh, and I was only scratching the surface. I mean, you're also the president of the NHA, editor-in-chief, you're a former judge, a former lawyer. Uh, there's so much, and we're gonna get into some of that too, especially the NHA and the wonderful magazine that you have. But uh, I wanna talk about how you have been whole food plant-based your entire life. And I should also add the first 32 years of that were raw, which is just adding some more unbelievable stuff on top. How did that happen? Uh, I would imagine that your parents must have really been on board with this and uh, maybe doing it on their own too. Well, my privilege is that, uh, that my parents, Max and Ruth Huberman, were way ahead of their time. Uh, in 1948, they had some health problems like most people. My late great father used to say, most people don't worry about their health until after they've lost it. And my father had polio. My mother had some thyroid and some and, and, and appendix issues. My brother, my older brother had bronchial asthma. And they had the good fortune of working for a guy that owned a furniture company by the name of Ben Blumenthal, who was an ardent vegetarian. And at that time, and that wasn't so common back then, but he was an ardent vegetarian. And he believed in, in having a juice machine and having a slant board and exercising and having fresh air and pure water and things like that. And he just, you know, was a, he, politically, he and my father were kind of aligned on a lot of things. So um, he said, Max, you know, there is another way. And once you come see a lecture uh, with, with uh, Dr. Herbert Shelton and Dr. Gerald Benish that were lecturing for the American Natural Hygiene Society in Cleveland, Ohio, he said, just come and listen. You know, I'm not going to proselytize you, but listen, see if it makes sense to you. And you know what, what that secret sauce is that makes people just change their ways? I don't know. You know, if we could figure that out, we'd have a million dollars. People are always trying to do that. But there are some that it just does. Sometimes it's a health crisis. Sometimes it's just the logic, but to my father, you know, he was a very, very, very broad minded by both my parents were, but particularly my father was a reader and, and, a, and, a, and a very literate kind of guy. And so it just kind of made sense. And though, like for most people, it was a journey, you know, nobody becomes whole food plant-based overnight. I mean, a few people do, but most don't. He didn't, my mother didn't. But the story with little Marky is I come along there three years into this journey, still trying to figure it out and doing some of the big things like my mother, you know, not wanting to vaccinate their kids, not wanting to give them cow's milk. That was kind of crazy. Now, my older brother wasn't raised the way I was because he was, he's three years older than me and they were just really starting in this. But I come along and they're much more the true believers in all this. So in 1951, June of 1951, um, I come along and and it was a very different world in 1951 than it is now. And the idea that you wouldn't want to vaccinate your kids, the idea that you wouldn't want to um, give them milk in, in, in school and dairy and things like that was pretty crazy. Cheese, you needed the protein, you needed the calcium. If you didn't do those things, well, my parents you know, didn't want to do that. So I'm born happy, eight pound, five ounce, beautiful little kid. But the family put so much pressure my, my mother's side of the family, my father's side of the family, that they were neglecting their children. They were calling the Humane Society on my parents for neglecting their children. It just was kind of crazy. So my mother trying to nurse me, at least this is the story they tell me, her milk spoiled. And I developed a condition called projectile vomiting where I couldn't keep any food down. 
And so as things would have it, I think I mentioned earlier, they, uh, in 1948, 49, they went to a lecture of Dr. Benish, who happened to be in Cleveland, one of the founders of the American Natural Hygiene Society, the, the forebearers of the NHA. And uh, Dr. Benish just took one more look at my parents and he was a very strong kind of charismatic guy. And he said, listen, he says, number one, you got to get somebody that can hold little Marky that's calm because my mother was pretty nervous and all that. Just get somebody that's calm. His, his body will calm down. I mean, this was psychological insight. Before. He, was a, he was a chiropractor, but saying, hey, do this. And in that interim period, and this is probably the only time I've ever been non-vegan in my life, for a month till, you're, till you calm down and your nursing is better, try to find some raw goat's milk for this kid, something gentle around his system. Long story short, we got somebody who held me, a, a caregiver that was a really close friend that was calm. I started holding my food down. I bridged with a little goat's milk, then got in my mother's milk came back normally and healthy. And I made it through for reasons that still kind of, as I look back, still sort of defy imagination. My parents, who were vegetarians, but not vegans. My father, who still smoked, it was a habit that he didn't kick for years. Um, my mother, again, who, who was not even vegan, made her own butter, did those sort of things at home. They raised me on raw fruits and vegetables. Why? Because when I went through that health crisis, Dr. Benish said, the ultimate Sheltonian diet, the best food for humanity, is raising them on whole foods, truly whole foods. And whole foods meant peaches and mangoes and apples, and things like that. Not kind of what we think of whole food plant-based today, but it was right. truly whole foods. I got through, I, I guess the way I look back at it, I pulled through, I survived, I began to thrive. And somehow maybe they just weren't gonna mess with a good thing. That's the way they raised me. They loved me. I trusted them. We had a father knows best family. We all, if my parents told me this was the right way to eat and live, they loved me. So I believed that. And I believed that all through my grade school and high school. And, and then as I got older and I had the good fortune of, of growing up with Alan Goldhammer and Joel Furman, and these guys were a little bit younger than me, but, you know, learning that, that these principles that my parents raised me on more as a matter of faith and belief, almost religion, uh, have been, were validated scientifically. It really did make sense. And this and, was in the fifties, uh, right? This is in the fifties. I was born in 1951. There wasn't even the term, Colin Campbell didn't invent the term whole food plant-based. I was <laughs> going to say, we were, people think, uh, I was going to say, people think that this is a, a, a fairly new kind of thing that uh, goes back to the maybe the well, and one 80s of the or something. things that I have is that the American Natural Hygiene Society that my parents then became members of and that I grew up in that were led by Dr. Shelton and Dr. Benish and now today by Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Furman and Dr. Frank Sabatino people that have grown up in that movement uh, these people were they're the real pioneers of the whole food plant-based health movement yeah. our organization was founded in 1948 and if wow. you look at the pictures of the banquets of those annual banquets that we've had for all of our 70 years, the banquets in those days, whole foods meant peppers and tomatoes and carrots, right. you know, occasionally some cashew butter or something and avocados, but it was truly whole foods. So we were, my parents were way ahead of their time. And I guess as I look back 70 years, I don't think, I don't think I look 70 years old. Right. I don't feel 70 years old. My kids and now my grandchild, uh, I play with them like, I, I don't look that much different other than a little bit of a receding hairline, a little bit of gray, salt and pepper hair. And, um, I don't look that much different than I did when I graduated from high school. I've had the same weight, same size, pretty much the same energy. Uh, I don't claim that I'm perfect health. I got a little hearing loss. I got, you know, we all have a few things, but had, I, I've had a couple of cavities along the way. I think I had my first one when I was 50. But I don't think that this diet and lifestyle guarantees you perfect health. I think it guarantees you, gives you the opportunity to do the best you got with what you have and to have a great say-so in controlling your own health destiny. That's what I think. Those right. are the choices that I make every day 
because although I'm 71, I, 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 I want to be this vital when I'm 91 and 101. No guarantees, but I think I do hold the keys in my hand. Right. Hold the keys to the ignition that I can drive this car pretty well, and I'll keep putting good, good gas and good oil and all that into it. Um, you know, I heard, I was listening when I was listening to an interview, watching one of your um, uh, YouTube uh, broadcasts. You said that you like to, you, you're a fan of Alan Goldhammer, as am I. He's yeah. just a great guy. And he has a, has a great sense of humor. And when he said about how our society is designed to make us sick and, and all that, one of my favorite quotes that kind of encapsulates my personal philosophy of this lifestyle is Caldwell Esselstyn, another guy that you're a fan of, I know, that we share. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and Caldwell says, for most of us, we have a warranty period. And for most of us, we can really do a lot of things to ourselves. Now, we know that younger and younger people are developing juvenile diabetes. And, but for most of us, we can abuse this body of ours quite a bit. But, you know, into the 40s for most people, sometimes into the 50s. But what Caldwell says, if you're not taking care of yourself, that warranty is going to run out. And that's when you're going to have problems. And right. fortunately, you know, we can reverse some of these problems, but, you know, the body's not a perfect machine. It's, it's, it, there are parts that wear out and uh, the parts that can be beaten up and you develop, you know, you, 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 your thyroid breaks down. That's a pretty tough one. Your, your prostate breaks down. That's a pretty tough one. You develop Alzheimer's. It's pretty tough to reverse some of that stuff. Prevention's better the key. And that's kind of what we're all about. What I'm all about. That's kind of how I try to live every day. How much sleep I get, what I put on my plate, stuff like that. But that's the Mark Huberman story. Right. So I, Again, I don't set myself up as I don't look like Rip Esselstyn. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a, 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 my father was a hunk of a guy. I didn't inherit those genes, but with what I got, I do pretty well. And I'm, yes. I'm very, I'm very, uh, I'm very honored by my history and, and feel that I'm just a very, very lucky guy. Well, you know, history. what you say about fuel and engine and performance we're talking about a car, we can be talking about the human body, we have our own fuel, the way that we're designed. I mean, you can take a look at our instincts that inform the way that we're built on the inside. And that's how we're supposed to eat. You know, we know what food is, we can identify food. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the more that we go with our instincts, not taste, I'm talking about the instincts, like we know that an apple or a fruit or vegetable, that is food. Uh, we don't see meat as food until it's on the store shelf. You stack the odds in your favor uh, by eating all these plant foods. And like you said, there is no silver bullet. It's not like, well, Mark's going to eat these foods and it's a guarantee that he's not going to have any health issues. But you played the odds, stacked them in your favor. And knowing what we know about whole plant foods and how it affects us, I'm not shocked that you're 70 years old and you're not taking pills and you haven't had any real major issues and you still look like you did maybe we, you know, when you were younger. That all makes sense. I know that you're just one guy, but, but it adds up when you take a look at you know, what's going on well, underneath. I'm, I'm, I'm one guy, but I, I, you know, again, the, the, the other uh, privilege of my life is that because of the, the, my involvement in this health movement for most of my adult life, for 50 of my years, I've been on the board of the NHA and I've been involved in putting on conferences and publishing the magazine. I've, I've come in contact with and become close personal friends and colleagues with Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer and Frank Sabatino and Michael Clapper and these people. So I'm not alone. If you look at these guys, you know, Joel right. Furman is, is just a couple of years younger than me. And he looks every bit as good right. as I. I mean, he looks better than I do, actually, I think. Alan Goldhammer is, a, you know, again, they eat the same way I do. Yeah. They eat predominantly whole foods, predominantly live foods, most of salads. Salads. Yeah. You know, and they, one of the gripes I have is, uh, is that in the vegan chic movement that we've gotten into, um, salads have almost disappeared. You know, you, you go to a vegan restaurant, you're hard pressed to find the salad with romaine lettuce and cucumbers and peppers and tomatoes. You'll find quinoa this and these kind of lasagnas and things like that. But 
That's not Whole Foods to Mark Huberman. And it's not Whole Foods to Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer and people like that. It's Whole Foods. It's the, the, the bounty of fresh fr of fruits and vegetables, not seeds. That's, that's where they are. And that's my salad is like this every day. And it's the same with Joel. It's the same with Alan. And, and I think that's just something that's missing even within the whole food plant-based health movement. You know, even the term plant-based, Colin Campbell doesn't even like it. He said yeah. he came up with it because of one of anything else, but you know, marijuana is plant-based. Potato chips are plant-based. Everything is plant-based. So in the NHA, we talk about a whole plant food diet. Right. Kind of shy away from the plant-based because it's tricky and right. it's deceptive. And as Dr. Furman, again, I got a lot of favorite phrases just like you do. And Dr. Furman says, your salad should be your main meal. That's what you should start your dinner on. And then you can have your baked potatoes or your split pea soup or whatever it is you're doing, but fill up on your salad. You'll never put on weight because of calorie density and all that doing that plus right. all the nutritional benefits you get right from that. but I, I just think if there's one message that i like to impart to people as being one of the most seasoned veterans of the whole food plant-based health movement is that it, it need we need to get back to the whole foods side of it and less right. of the plant-based and we'd right. all be better a lot better off get all yeah. those vital nutrients micronutrients all those things that science has identified that just made sense to our pioneers that the simpler things are, the closer you live in harmony with nature, the more, the more sense it makes and the better for the planet and all that. But it, it's just a, um, it's just a, uh, from the standpoint of, again, controlling your own health destiny, making choices every day, what you eat. To me, that's a top priority. Right. And it sometimes gets lost in the weeds of all mm -hmm. this, with all the, there's a million cookbooks out there, millions of them, great ones, but, nothing beats the salad and whole foods and fresh fruits and vegetables and that that's my right. choice so. i do want to get into more of what you eat especially i want to know what you eat when you were in the early days but i want to know because something has to drive you to not take a slice of pizza to not eat one ham hamburger i mean you know your parents aren't there What's the big deal? One slice, one bite of this. What's what was it that drove you to never even go down that road? Uh, that could have really opened up. That really could have been your downfall if if you had done that. What was going on there? Well, uh, again, I don't think anything drove me. Uh, I, I've often thought, and I've been interviewed a lot about what I, you know, how I grew up and what I've done. And I've always said that, at least as I look back, I think taste is a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. What you've never tasted, you've never missed. It's not, it was never willpower for me. There were things I just had no interest in. And again, I think for most people, the pleasure trap that Alan Goldhammer calls it, you know, chocolate and, all, all, and, and maple syrup and all these sort of things that make things so aromatic for people. There, it's much greater temptation when you've had it. But when you've never had it, it's, it was never willpower for me. I just was never interested in it. And again, maybe all the more remarkable, amazing, I don't know, unusual is that, as I mentioned, my parents, my older brother um, didn't, wasn't raised on raw foods. My mother wasn't, my parents weren't vegans probably till I was late in high school. It was a, an evolution for them, but here I was, but I just wasn't interested. So my mother made great eggplant patties and wild rice. She's a great vegetarian and even vegan cook a long way and I confess, you know, her stuff smelled good, but I don't know, it's just not anything I was interested in. And so I always kind of, I just sort of did my own thing. I think I was always somebody in life and I think I've kind of remained this way today. I mean, I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin. I know what I think politically. I have very strong political values, social values. Uh, um, and it doesn't really matter to me what other people think. But, you know, back to your question, um, I liked what I liked. I, I would, when I, when I would go to grade school and everybody, and, and again, I, I don't know how old you are, Anthony, but, you know, going back to the fifties, when I grew up in grade school, you had a, you come and you bought your lunch or, you know, if you brought your lunch, they'd sell you bottles, little bottles of milk. 
and you get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a cookie. And that was your life, maybe an apple occasionally, but my lunches were a brown bag that I'd bring and I'd have um, in season, I'd have a peach cut in half with some cashew butter in the middle. And I'd have a, um, uh, uh, an apple, I'd have maybe some cut up melon or something like that. Um, and what I often like to say is that my parents <clears throat> were really the, 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 the real fathers of trail mix because the way I grew up, my candy were cashews and raisins or filberts and dried apricots and things like that. And that was always my little baggie. And, and it also, I think, served to sustain me because I think they say today that having healthy fats are what are satiating people that don't, that kind of shy away from that for sometimes people with heart problems and things like that to want to, it's tough to say satisfied, but if you throw some cashews and macadamia nuts or fill hazelnuts or pecans, and you have those in your lunch with some fruit, it's, it, it satisfies you. And so that's what it was for me. So I always had my, and that's how I grew up, day in and day out. So day in and day out, my breakfast was some orange juice. And again, before smoothies were in the fashion, Dr. Benish was a fan of, of telling my mother would grind up almonds, and sunflower seeds and put those in my orange juice in the morning. And again, it had that satiating effect, but it also had those healthy fats. And that's how I, that was my breakfast with a fruit salad or something. Lunch, I just described what I would take to school. Dinner, I'd come home, I'd have a big salad. And there was always avocado because that was the other, avocado was my lifeline. I think if I didn't have avocado and maybe I never would have made it in this world because avocado was again, a healthy fat, but a satiating fat. Um, and uh, that was my butter, but it, it was a butter that never went on a potato or never gets, never gets smushed on corn um, or on corn on the cob. It's just kind of what I did. So that was, and believe it or not, I look forward to that every day. Uh, probably the only other thing I would say is that was that the, evolved a little bit is that when I grew up in the American Natural Hygiene Society at our conferences, vegetable oil, crude sunflower oil, cold press, things like that, were not viewed as unhealthy as they are today. It, it, there wasn't the recognition of calorie density. There wasn't the recognition of that these are just pure fat denatured from all the fiber and all that. So that was a salad dressing that certainly made salads more interesting. And certainly if I was out at a restaurant, salads weren't like salads today, but even there, if you didn't have a little bit of vegetable oil on it, it was pretty boring. And, but I always kind of had an avocado in my pocket. That's kind of a trademark too, that I never took a chance on a store salad. But uh, so again, day in and day out, I look forward to it every day. But I think it's just like, I look forward to the Cleveland Indians being on the radio and, and the Cleveland Browns playing football. Um, and, and the latest uh, movie that would come out or baseball, I was a baseball card collector and playing games and things like that. I look forward to that every day. And food was just my fuel for that. I never really looked at food as, as perhaps the social phenomenon that it is for most people, that the, yeah. the eminent variety and the fascination with fast food restaurants. And it, it just wasn't part of my upbringing and it isn't today. And I didn't maybe just add one more thing is that as I grew up and we had a very, we had a very traditional Jewish family. So for Rosh Hashanah, the high holidays, Thanksgiving, Passover, the family would all gather and I had lots of cousins and they would all have the traditional matzo ball soup and all the things you do on Jewish holidays. And everybody was eating all these different things. I don't know. It, it just never, it, it was never interested in me. And the only thing I would say is that uh, there were certain foods that I just thought were odd. Um, if somebody was eating a hot dog, I never thought oh, what, that is the most offensive thing in the world. Of course, I didn't see it slaughtered. I didn't see the, you know, the sausage being made, but I never really bothered me. But every, when, when I would once in a while go to an event, there'd be, they'd be roasting a pig on a stick. Or if I'd be in a grocery store, and even to this day, and you see lobsters crawling around, live lobsters crawling around in a, in a tank that somebody will buy, and they'll pick it up, and they'll put it in boiling hot water. I'm thinking, what? Society is crazy. 
I this think if really, I this think is if, really nuts. Yeah, yeah. I, but I, 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 I'm not that I'm not that I look down and judge. I didn't, you know, condescend anybody. I just thought, wow, this is this is something that that I find offensive, personally offensive, and, and regrettable. And thinking, what kind of people, what kind of insensitivity is there? in those human beings that can do that. But I know there's plenty of fellow magistrates and lawyers that I've worked with that are advent hunters or wonderful people. They just see the world through different eyes than I do. But I think that if we didn't kill for food, as Jeffrey Rudd wrote a famous book back in England made back when, we'd be a more sensitive society. I think we'd have less racism. I think we'd have less, less, less uh, uh, sexism. I think we'd just be a more sensitive society, but that's just what I think. I think if more people saw the violence that went into the food that, that they ate, they would have a different, they would see it differently because they Obviously. see it on the, on the supermarket shelf. It looks all nice and clean. And, and of course they come home and they flavor it and it's great, you know, but they didn't see what went into making that. Upton Sinclair wrote the book, The Jungle. And he, and, he, mm. and he made the point years ago that, you know, there's a reason that slaughterhouses are outside the city limits. Nobody sees them. They don't do the, you know, in Chinese markets, I guess, you know, this is pretty kind of crazy stuff, but that's not the main in the world. Most of them are the slaughter. You don't see it. You see these beautifully packaged nitrate, nitrite red beef. It just doesn't, it's disconnected from the source of how it really got there. Right. But for me, you know, I never, I had cousins and we all go, we all go camping and they all go fishing. I never even liked to hook a worm. I always thought that was just also weird. I did it once, I suppose, but I, I just found this to be, what the hell is this? What, where is the fascination in that? Let alone, you know, hiding in a tree to shoot a deer. Or, or when I got married to my wife or dad, they're from Virginia and they would raise rabbits and then they, Tack them up, <laughs> make rabbit stew. I'm thinking these poor innocent creatures. Right. Um, but again, I, I don't go through life. That's not my highest priority. But boy, I think the world would be in a better place mm -hmm. if we were uh, and we living more in harmony with nature yeah. than trying to master nature and its various critters. So I think this lifestyle works uh, so well on so many levels for all of humanity that uh, more people to do the world would be in a better place. I think what you what you said before about how you never tasted that stuff, so you never had a craving for it. That was Chef AJ it, said. If I write a book, I should call it "Don't Get Started." <laughs> and I do think, by the way, yeah. I, my wife and I have our first grandchild, and this is we've been waiting a long time. And my wife uh, babysits a couple days a week. And one of the wonderful things that we have imparted to to to. Uh, our, my niece and nephew raising this child is that, you know, at least get them exposed to raw foods, to strawberries and cherries and things like that. Because if you don't get that taste early on, you'll never compete with chocolate and mac and cheese and all these sort of things. So fortunately, up till now, um, our little eight month old precious child is loves sucking on a strawberry. And, and my wife learned this thing you can freeze, uh, and these little nipple shaped things, you can freeze broccoli and, wow. and bananas and things like that and yam. And, and I, it's just thrilling for me to see those tastes develop early on. There'll be enough time for all the other stuff, but at least get yeah. the taste started. I think that's a great thing. So yeah. it, it makes my day every time I see it. Definitely. That's one of the greatest gifts that you can possibly give. I mean, you never know what's going to happen later, but you can only do but so much. Uh, and, and I think that that's a tremendous way to get started. You know, it's uh, also in this lifestyle, again, you're in the health coaching business, but it's also a belief of mine that, that you can't proselytize to people. Right. You can plant seeds. And so I look yeah. at these things of introducing these foods as planting seeds. Um, uh, I, I don't proselytize about my, my uh, plant-based diet. I don't, I don't proselytize about my religion. If somebody asks me about it, or if you ask me about it, I'll talk to you all day long. But I don't think, I don't think that's how you convince people of anything. You do it by example and, and plant seeds and hope that people will figure it out themselves. That's how it works. That's how it worked for my life. He was, we were, we've been married 30, we'll be married 32 years this year. 
and the first 20, she was vegan, kind of a junk food vegan, I guess, best way you could describe it. But, you know, Amy's pot pies and, and, um, and soy creamers and soy silk creamers and stuff like that. But, you know, it, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I had the right to impose my belief on her any more than my religion. And that, but fortunately, when she went to True North in 2011 and had her aha moment, um, the fact that she's joined me on this journey is just uh, died and gone to heaven. It's great. That's it's really great. It's wonderful. And it's, it's like you went through another round of, I mean, you, you had food that you don't eat in, in your own house, right? Like oh. when you first got married, but that even that wasn't something that you didn't cave and be like, well, this is my, this is, this is my wife. And, you know, we're I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I could have, but that's what I would think. I don't that's want to give myself think. that much credit, but you know, again, I, there are just things that I, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I've grown up without medication. Uh, I grew up without being immunized and things like that. And, and I don't like needles and shots. And I don't think to this day I could swallow a pill. And I've had, a, I had an implant one time where they said I had to take uh, amoxicillin, you know, because it could get infected when the cavities open and things like that. That was difficult for me. Very difficult for me. I did it. I'm not, I don't, I don't die my principles. To, you know, I, I'd rather live my compromises than die my principles sometimes. But I don't want to say it wasn't difficult um, because, uh, again, I, you, you kind of grow up with, with certain values and instincts and likes and dislikes. And so to this day, um, making those choices, staying away from, a, from an ice cream cone, uh, it's not hard. Right. I, I don't want to say that I'm this great character and I have this great will of fortune. I don't. It's just it's me. It's the choices I make and the instincts I have, and it's allowed me to function pretty comfortably. Dr. Shelton used to say, or sometimes that it was difficult sometimes to live hygienically in an unhygienic world. Mm. It, it, it was for me because of the, the foundation that I was given by my parents, and then that being cultivated as I got into my more adult life and could think for my own and make my own decisions, realizing how much wisdom and science supports the way that I've been raised. And now, now everything I do is conscious choice. Even if, it, even if, even if it's, uh, even if willpower and desire and all that are part, now it's conscious choice. I know that, I know that, that, that eating organic foods is a conscious choice. I know avoiding, you know, GMOs is a conscious choice. Avoiding things with added salt, oil, and sugar, even among, vegan soups is a conscious choice. Those are good choices to make. Mm -hmm. I do them every day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when we cave, it's because we're thinking of, of how it tasted when we had it last, last time and, and the experience that, that we had, and you don't have that. That's a unique thing. And my that's wife very, very say, powerful. My, my wife would say that if she took a cup of coffee, coffee was one of the last ones to go organic coffee, notwithstanding. Um, silk creamer notwithstanding, but if she, I think she would say to this day that if she took one cup of coffee, it would be almost like an alcoholic. It would be really hard. And I get that. It's not my experience, but I get that. And I see it all the time with people that, again, don't have the, the, the good fortune to have been raised like me. They, do, they have grown up in the pleasure trap. They have, they have been exposed to these addicting foods. Uh, and if it's kind of like an argument, you know, that's often made, you know, that if you talk to Alan Goldhammer, you know, Alan Goldhammer is a 100% guy. We all know that nobody, you know, that most people, it's a journey. Nobody becomes SOS free overnight. But if you talk to Alan Goldhammer, he'll say, you know, there's a value in doing that though. Cold turkey. Yeah. make the break because the pleasure trap is so strong. And, you know, so oh. that's, I think what we do in the NHA is that we know at our banquets and at our meals that we serve at our conferences, that not everybody is SOS free, but at our conference, we set the ideal. We set the gold standard and we say, look, this is what you want to aspire to. And we're here to show you how good it can taste mm -hmm. and how satisfying it can be. Uh, and that you can you can saute your stuff with broth instead of oil, 
and that you can cook with 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 um, with uh, uh, celery juice instead of salt and salting and things that you can make. You know, you can make brownies and cookies. You know, with oats and dates and things like that, and it can be good. No, and then not everybody's going to do that. But we're gonna, we're here to set the goal, set the standard, and mm -hmm. that's what we do. And I think we do it really well. Yeah, and speaking of the NHA, people may not know what what that is, um, but they should because they're the gold standard for the whole food plant-based movement, not the plant-based movement, the whole food plant-based movement. And they have conferences annually. Why don't you talk a little bit about the NHA? Sure. Well, we're the oldest organization on the planet advocating a 100% whole plant food diet that we've been doing since our founding in 1948 by, again, people like Herbert Shelton and Gerald Benish and, and, uh, and William Esser. Uh, these are people that were way ahead of their time. Um, and they started holding annual conferences in 1949, where, uh, again, the faithful of this movement gathered and continue to gather. And we do it every year. This year, it's going to be June 24th to the 26th in Cleveland, where some of the leading voices of this movement come every year. Joel Furman, Alan Goldhammer, Stefan Esser, uh, Frank Sabatino. But we also bring in some other well-known people. This year, we have Columbus Batiste. Uh, the cardiologist, um, um, uh, Brenda Davis, the you know, mm. oh, yeah. you know, a dietitian in that. Uh, we have some great people, and it's June 24th to the 26th. Your meals are included for the weekend. We're one of the most affordable conferences you could go to. I think it's $665 for the weekend. It includes your dinner on Friday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner on Saturday, breakfast and lunch, all your all your other uh, activities included. It's an embassy suites and in Independence, right outside of Cleveland. It's a free shuttle from the airport. Uh, so it's a great, it's it's wonderful. You know, I think one of the things, one of the observations I have of being in this movement for so long is that it's not often that couples do this together. More often than not, it's a wife or a husband because of their health problem and the other, they love each other, so they support each other. But, you know, they're not always so lucky and it's a lonely journey. And you don't know a lot of like-minded people spread around the country. You don't get invited to dinner. They, they wouldn't want to come to your house for dinner. So to come together of like-minded people for an entire weekend and not have to worry about running out to Whole Foods to get something for your room uh, is a wonderful experience. And then to, to when, when Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer and these people come to our conferences, they hang out like everybody else. You're eating lunch with them. They're, they're just sitting in the, in the auditorium like everybody else. So it's a really interesting experience. It's community. Yeah. And that's pretty, uh, as my late great father used to say, when you come to one of these conferences, even if you've been doing it for a long time, it recharges your battery. It, yeah. it re-inspires you to, uh, to, and you always learn something new. You know, I always, I think we're always learning something new. So it's a great weekend. That's the, 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 one of the principal education things that the NHA does. Uh, by the way, we were the American Natural Hygiene Society till about 1980, and we recognized that name was just confusing. It sounded like feminine hygiene products. And even though hygiene, historically in Greek, was the science of health, which is what we've always been about, and natural hygiene was a kind of an integrated science of health, of all the elements of health, but it was confusing to people. So in 1980, you know, we kicked around what would be good names, and, and um, we thought, well, we're all about health. Um, we're not about, uh, you know, we, we certainly support animal rights. We certainly support veganism. We certainly support harmlessness, but we're primarily about health and the science of health. So we came up with the term health science, which became our URL. It became the name of our magazine, but we changed our name, the National Health Association, because that's really what we're all about. Mm -hmm. And so we, that, that's been our name. Membership in the NHA hasn't changed in probably 20 years. We're a 501c3, so we, we don't sell anything other than information. It's still $35 a year. And for that $35 a year, you get a, a, a print copy of Health Science Magazine, which is, uh, I, I'm the editor of it, but even if I wasn't, I probably say, I think it's one of the best. I have one. It's one yeah. of the best magazines on the planet. What's really unique about it is that it's 40 pages long and it has no advertising. And for our 44 years of publishing it, it's had no advertising. And a 44, a 40 page magazine of that quality, it's as, as you've seen, I think, Anthony, it's yeah. the quality of Newsweek or anything that's on the newsstand yep. in terms of paper and pictures and quality. 
We do it because our members support it. They donate every year. We do an appeal to keep it a print publication and people are very generous with us in doing it. But that's really, you know, in this movement, everybody kind of has their space. You know, the, the, the Barnard Center and, you know, all that Neil Bernard does, he, he makes his contributions, McDougal makes his contribution, the Esselstyns do their thing. Uh, everybody has their space. So our space is our annual conferences and our magazine. It's something of which we're really proud. My biggest contribution to the magazine, other than being the executive editor, is that I get to do a feature interview uh, with, with all of the top voices in our, in our field, some that I've known and some I get to know by doing it. Michael Greger, I didn't know. I'd had him as a speaker, but I never really met him personally. I got to meet him personally at a seminar in Akron. We had dinner together, and I interviewed him, and that was a treasure. Called Lesselson, the same. For the upcoming issue, so the, the, the upcoming issue spring that I'm working on right now, I just finished editing the interview with one guy, truly a dean of the movement that I'd never met somehow, was Dean Ornish. Oh, wow. And he's an amazing guy. And when you read the interview that I just got finished editing, it'll probably come out in April. Um, he really is, uh, he's the real deal. He, I, I yeah. told him he should have been, he could have been one of the founders of the organization because he talked about his observation about the unity of disease, that the problem with the misfocus of the medical profession, the orthodox profession, is focuses on looking at individual diseases, individual conditions as being ends of themselves. It's something to mean to be treated rather than try and identify and remove the cause. And that for one person, it's diabetes. For another person, it's cancer. For another person, it's prostate disease. But the diseases are all the same expression right. of the body being out of whack. Yep. And the solution is the same. Yep. The treatment is the same of a whole plant food diet with exercise and rest and movement and love. And he's got his own unique things that he mixes into it. But it's true. But anyway, that's what you get when you get Health Science Magazine. And it's not just an interview with Dean Ornish about what he thinks about, what his program is like. You'll learn who Dean Ornish was and how he, what, what prompted him to get into this business and that he was suicide, he was on the verge of suicide when he was in college. Yeah. And, and the Swami that he met. So, and I try to do that with every interview I do. Who are, who are these people? Not just who is the celebrity, um, or, or drfurman.com, learning about what you can buy on drfurman.com or, or what it'll be like to go fast at the True North Health Center. I, I'm, and, and that's a, people tell me it's a knack that I have. I'm a pretty good of kind of getting a story out of people, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful privilege for me oh, sure. uh, to do that. But anyway, so if you join the NHA for $35, you can go onto our website at healthscience.org. But better yet, for any of your viewers, I'm a long believer that people should get to look before they leap. So even if $35 is, 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 a, is a little bit steep, if they email me at mhuberman at healthscience.org, mhuberman at healthscience.org, I'll send them a free PDF of the latest issue of the magazine, winter 2022. Awesome. And if they like it and they join the NHA, they join within a week or 10 days after that, I'll send them a print copy. That's um, awesome. So they'll, they'll get a jump on their membership and they'll be in line for the for the uh, spring issue. And one other thing about the NHA, when you become a member and you register on our website, we also have 14 or 15 eBooks on the history of the natural hygiene movement. There's a book called The Greatest Health Discovery that really talks about 18, 17th and 18th century pioneers like Sylvester Graham and Russell Trawl, who really inspired the Herbert Sheltons of the world that were talking about whole foods and fresh air and pure water and vegetarian diets in the 1700s and 1800s. And, and that's, those eBooks are free. If you're interested in water fasting, which has become really popular these days, the most famous book to this day ever written on the subject of water fasting is Fasting Can Save Your Life by Herbert Shelton. Still the most popular book. You, if you find it on Amazon, it'll cost you probably 50 bucks. If you're a member of the NHA, it's one of those eBooks for nothing. So again, we're a 501c3. We've been there for since almost since our founding. And um, those are the benefits of membership for that 35 bucks a year. That's so, great. I think it's a bargain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's timeless information. You know, the human body has not changed in the past couple hundred years. Everything else has changed. The food has changed, the, the culture's changed, everything has changed. That, that information that those doctors imparted back in those days, it still applies 
one, one of the things we do in Health Science Magazine, you'll see in many issues, is we'll put in there something called timeless teachings. Mm. When these guys, Dr. Shelton, Dr. Essel, were writing back in the 50s, and what they were writing about the, the fear of plagues and, 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 and the, 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 the misguided approach to the medical profession and living in fear and controlling our own health destiny, these were, these were timeless teachings. And we reprint some of those in the magazine and archive them on our website that really were as true 50 years ago as they are today. They, these guys really were well ahead of their time without all the science on their hand. They just had their empirical observation that people got well. People would come in with a, a lump on their breast and they'd undertake a water fast and the, and the tumor would autolyze. People would have high blood pressure. They'd go on a fast and they didn't have high blood pressure anymore. They'd be on type two diabetes. They'd go on a water fast or adopt this diet and all of a sudden their blood sugar levels come down and they're not. And, and, but now we know the science of it. We know why that is. Yeah. It not only made sense, but it actually scientifically works out that way, which I find kind of nice given the life that I've led. Well, one of the things, and I said this in one of my videos, one of the things that I loved when I first got into this is I saw doctors having success. Dr. McDougall, Dr. Esselstyn, all of these guys, their patients come to them. The goal is to turn them around, get them out healthy. You don't see them again. Or if you do, they'll come and tell you, hey, I'm doing great. Because in my world, my parents' doctors or a lot of other people's doctors, I, I, there's, it seems like it's a revolving door of meds and bad advice. And it seems like the average doctor is a pathetic one. These doctors that you're talking about, Ornish and Esselstyn and Goldhammer, these guys get results. To me, that speaks volumes. These are real doctors. What they do you do. think about you know, that? They, if, you, if you meet uh, physicians that do internships and that come to work there, that's what they say. That, that's the rewarding thing about this. Their patients actually get well. It's not like you have hypertension, you're going to be on, or, or, or a heart problem, you're going to be on statins for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's okay. That's the conventional wisdom. That's right. just the way it is. You know, again, I like quotes kind of like you do. Uh, there was a guy, one of the first MDs to really challenge the establishment uh, was uh, a guy by the name of Robert Mendelssohn. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he wrote mm -hmm. a book called his revolutionary book was called Confessions of a Medical Heretic. And he was a wonderful, wonderful, gentle sort of guy. And his claim to fame is that he testified uh, before Congress and, and a number of other, the loud chiropractors testified in defense of chiropractors being able to get reimbursed on insurance coverages. But Dr. Mendelssohn was opposed to, he, he would, his Confessions of a Medical Heretic was all the things that were wrong about the medical profession. I don't know what he actually stood for sometimes. I don't know if he was a vegan or whatever it is, but he was really just raised alarm bells about how, but he had one thing that I always liked. He said, you know, when God made us or whoever you believe put us here, they didn't make too many mistakes. We were here to live and to get well. And when we get sick, your body has mechanisms to get well. And you have an appendix. It's there for a purpose. You know, yeah, oh, we could take that out. You but no, God made us the right way. We, and we are, you know, when you get a cut on your, one of the analogies that I like to use, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm not the doctor and I don't even play one. But, you know, it, it just always made sense to me that if you get a cut on your wrist, what do you do? You put a Band-Aid on it, right? To keep it clean and keep it closed. The Band-Aid doesn't heal it. Your body heals it because that's the way it works. Yep. Somehow people understand that externally. They don't understand it internally. They don't. Right. They think somehow it's just different, and it's not. And that's what all of these this exploding, beautifully exploding world of lifestyle medicine realizing that your body is an amazing temple. It really does have extraordinary capacities to heal itself. The core of the natural hygiene movement. And the natural hygiene doctors like Dr. Shelton and Dr. Benish and Dr. Esser and the people that, you know, they, that, that they've inspired like Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Sabatino and that all say that again, the body is, has amazing powers to restore itself. There are limits, but it's got a lot of amazing power and that the beauty of water fasting and the people that go on those kind of conditions or adopt a really healthy, pure diet yeah. is that you're creating that 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 those conditions conducive to the body maximizing its 
inherent healing capacity. That's what happens and they see it every day. Um, it's just an amazing thing that the capacity that the body's got to heal itself when just given the chance. That's right. We don't give it the chance. The approach of conventional medicine is you got a fever, there's something wrong, you got to suppress the symptom. Right. Rather than trying to remove the cause, rather than looking at that symptom as an alarm bell, the body's telling you, hey, it's out of balance. Homeostasis is out of balance. Do like animals do when a dog is sick, they go curl up in a corner and they rest. Right. We don't do that way. No, we take a pill. Right. We got a headache. We take a pill. We don't think, well, why do I got a headache? Maybe I'm working too much. Maybe I'm too stressed. Maybe I'm, 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 I'm just out of balance. Rest. It's, it's as fundamental to human nature and human physiology. And that's what fortunately more and more lifestyle physicians are recognizing that the body is an amazing mechanism if given a chance. It is. Most it is. And a so when you fast, your body is in a hyper healing kind of mode, but you can't stay like that forever, right? There, well, there you comes can say that way. You say that way a lot longer than you thought. Well, you know, I, Alan I think I, Alan, Alan Goldhammer would say that, you know, most people equate fasting and starvation. And there's a huge difference. And again, I'm not going to play the doctor here and try to explain all the science of it. But I know from my observation that that people can fast comfortably under medical supervision. It's not something you fool around with at home, but fast right. 10, 30, 40 days right. uh, under supervision and your body has amazing capacities. But in that time, the theory is that, again, you're conserving energy. Your body's not being burdened with digestion and elimination and all those things. You are, it's a physiological rest. Right. And when your body doesn't have to do all these other things and you're not in all the stresses of life, the body just instinctively knows what to do. And it's kind of like, uh, again, when you read my Ornish interview that's coming out, he says, you know, an amazing thing. He says, when people come for his reversing heart disease program, other stuff gets better because the yeah. prescription is the same. So if they've suffered, if they've suffered prostate problems, if they've suffered eczema, if they've suffered all these other things, how about that? They all tend to improve. Yeah because the prescription is the same, the approach is the same. Mm -hmm. It really does work. And it's again, not that, not, that, um, not that you're drinking green tea or some secret potion or spirulina or something, I don't know. It's that your body has these amazing inherent healing capacities. That's how we're meant to be. And Just we're, like we're meant to grow. How hair grows back. Right, and we, we're also we, eating- Cells regenerate. Right. And we're eating in line with how we're actually built. That exactly. is the optimal fuel, the same way the owner's manual in your car would say the optimal fuel for this car is not just any gas. It's the high grade gas. If you want to use the low grade, you, you can, but the engine will probably wear faster. You may have some more problems. It's kind of like what happens with us. I mean, the human body, we can throw a lot of things down there, but results vary. I believe when we stray from how we were actually built my and late great father used to say that you know most people know more about the nutritional needs of their pet canary than they do about their own health and it's, it's yeah true they spend more time thinking about that and what kind of dog food they get well yeah about their own food when you're all right so when you're not fasting right let's say you do 30 40 days and you got to get off it and you have to start eating what which is not one of my favorite things to do by the way i right i i, I hate water fasting you know if when i'm when i'm if i'm overtaxed and i'm up too late editing magazines and not getting enough sleep and i a cold's coming on and things like that i you know i prefer to just kind of catch myself before i slip too far because i hate water fasting i find it boring i find it <laughs> i prefer to 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 use that prevention Try to keep my make make conscious choices every day to stay healthy and not have to recover my health because I've violated one of the rules of living by nature. But you know, right. So you know, when you do start eating after a fast, what do you eat? You have to eat foods that are in line with how your body's made. And that's why it's important to follow a fast with natural foods, you know. And and well, uh, I mean, most people, again, I'm the doctor, not the, not the guy but i know from my observation and knowing all these people that they do the the easiest things on the body and if they're the easiest things on the body after a fasting state why wouldn't it be the easiest things on the body before the fasting state right. so it is you know melon you know watermelon juice 
fresh vegetable juices, slowly introducing things. That just makes sense to me. I, I guess I've always thought, again, I, I come from different lenses through which most people see the world just because of the way I was raised. But it always just made sense to me that if you were buying peanut butter in a grocery store, why wouldn't you buy the fresh ground peanut butter? Why wouldn't you avoid the peanut, if you look on the label, of even in Whole Foods, and there'll be 15 varieties of peanut butter. Why wouldn't you eat the one that's just peanuts? Doesn't that make more sense? And it can still taste fine, and as it does, and when you're fresh dry, why wouldn't you do that? My late great father again used to say that if something has more than five ingredients in it, don't buy it, and don't eat it. You know, it, 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 there is a philosophy about it, but the simpler things are, the easier they got to be, the more in keeping with how nature intended for us. Yeah. And if you do, if you simplify your diet when you're not feeling well, just because you don't want to tax yourself, you, you don't want to upset your stomach even more, doesn't it make sense that those are the logical things, the way you should be eating when you're not sick? Right. Because it's easier on your system. Why would you eat? Why would you? Why would you not want to avoid strawberry? You look at the dirty dozen and the clean 15 that the environmental working group does. Why wouldn't it make sense to eat strawberries that are not with all these toxic chemicals? To me, it's just common sense, sensible living. Put all the stuff about better for the planet and all that. But why wouldn't you make those choices? to eat cleaner, to eat healthier, to avoid less preservative. Most people today would say, you know, yeah, we should avoid fried foods. Yeah, we, should avoid, we should avoid red meat. We should avoid sausage and things like that. But why wouldn't you also think about just, you know, even making healthier choices within the healthier foods? Right. That's what I do anyway. Well, you had and said I feel that. good about it. Now, you had said that your wife went to True North, right? And she was a vegetarian. Did, did, did she run into issues eventually with so that kind wife, of diet? It's interesting. So my wife was a, 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 um, was a worked for a, 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 um, uh, a high level for an insurance company doing complex claims and was working a pretty stressful job. And again, you know, that's one of the things about life and balance and all that. You know, she was, she was living on, on, uh, on again, uh, when you're working until 10 or 11 o'clock at night, um, you're living on Amy's pot pies, fast foods you could put in the microwave. It takes time to make up a salad and things like that. Even when I made them up and, and wine and, you know, organic wine, sulfite free and all that, but it's still wine. It's always kind of, so she found herself in 2011, even though she'd been going to all these conferences and his best friends in the world with Lisa Furman, Dr. Furman's wife, and Jennifer Goldhammer, you know, Alan's wife and all these people, she knew. She knew the right thing, but she was in the pleasure trap like everybody else in the trap of life. And in November 2011, uh, I remember she came home one day and she was about 50 pounds overweight. Wasn't suffering any other health problems that I was aware of. Also, so a few menstrual things that were heavier than she wanted in that. But she just knew being around, this just wasn't right. And that it was time to, to it was her aha moment. And she'd been to True North once before, just kind of as a cleanse and all that, but still the pleasure trap is the pleasure trap. So she called Alan and said, listen, I'll, I'll, I really think I need to come out there. And he said, get a one-way ticket. <laughs> we had a holiday party for 50 members of her family were scheduled for our house three weeks later. She didn't come. She went out and it was that life-changing moment for her. So, I mean, she was vegan. But what I would, what I think she would call a junk food vegan, um, you know, if it was vegan, it was healthy. But we all know vegan is not healthy. Uh, it doesn't have to be healthy. It can be. I'm a vegan. I eat very healthy. But you know, salt, oil, sugar. You look in most vegan cookbooks. Right. They are loaded with sugar and oil, and that, I, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's, is it a step in the right direction? Of course it is. But is it healthy? No. So Wanda goes to True North. Fast, I believe, goes on a water fast for about 20, 20, 21 days. Reset her taste buds, which is, I think, what they say often happens to people. 
Also learned there was a fellow out there doing an internship who kind of introduced her to exercising. Wanda was never an exercise person. And after 21 days of learning the value of being SOS free, she called me before she came home and said, I want the pantry empty. I want the Keurig gone. I don't want to see it. Um, I want the wine gone. I don't want to see it. And I came home and she started exercising, going to Pilates. Now she's probably fitter than I am. Um, she's, she's, I mean, we both are pretty religious about exercising, but she'll go three days a week for weight training and two days a week for Pilates. And, and um, you know, the old saying about run like a girl, that was one, not now. Now she's athletic and quite athletic. But anyway, it's her aha moment, her taste changed. Her, she, she got the bigger picture, the perspective, and now she's every bit as diligent, if not more diligent than I am about this lifestyle. And again, my great fortune is for us to share this together so that you know, it used to be that if we would go, I'm a Broadway theater person. And up until COVID, I mean, I brought, that, that's, that's life for me. And I could just go see a Friday mat. I go into New York, see a Friday matinee, Friday evening, Saturday matinee, Saturday night, or Sunday matinee, and then we come home. And where do we eat? When we would meet the Furmans in New York, and, and in the old days, prior to wanting to go into True North, we'd find these vegan, vegetarian restaurants. But there was very little for me to eat there. I'd get a salad, a baked potato, maybe. But where would I go if I had the choice with Joel Furman? We'd go to Whole Foods for the salad bar. And that's, and now we both do that. And now we pack our stuff when we travel and we have it in the car together and to share that is um you know, i'm like at, at, you know for the last 10 years of, you know, i loved my wife beforehand right but this is an extra bit of special right. sauce and a special thing to, to share that is fabulous and that's another just privilege that i got and a good fortune that i got but Especially again at but, this time of life she had to find it her yeah. way yeah, Jennifer, it wasn't my way to say or to look down on her and say, Wanda, what are you doing? Don't you realize that every drink of wine you're taking is potential cancer causing? I would never say that to her. Right. I, I don't have the right to say that to her any more than I'd say, you know, you're a Methodist and I'm Jewish. You're a heathen. That's not. Number one, it's not the way you ever convince anybody. And I think she would say to this day that one of the reasons that she was able to evolve is because I didn't judge. Right. I had a cousin. I just did a, an, an, another interview on another show that got, got a lot of views and that. And a, a cousin watched it, a cousin of mine, who's about a year or two younger than me. And when she saw it and she heard me opine about, about not proselytizing, she said, as she looks back on all the family functions, I never did that. Right. I, I did my thing, but I never looked down on what they did. I never made fun or never, never criticized them for being incensed. Do you know where that meat comes from? Or why are you eating dairy? Don't you know that dairy is a cheese trap? That's not who Mark Huberman is. And I think that's why I've gained respect. I've been a public citizen most of my life. I was 20 years on our school board. I went to a lot of dinners. I always did my own thing. And everybody maybe snookered about a little bit. Oh, there's Huberman with his avocado, his baked potato. But you know, they came to respect that was who I was. And they came to respect that because I didn't judge what they did. Mm -hmm. I just asked that they not judge what I did. And they didn't because they liked me for the colleague that I was, not for, you know, what my dinner choice was. Right. And it's interesting how your wife didn't want any of that stuff in the house. Like she couldn't deal with it because she knew what it was. She knew which was the opposite yeah, of how you day. were. Yeah, because you yeah, could deal with it, day. but she, she had a different, and that's how a lot of people are. I mean, people most are. people, they, they, they actually know what the experience was, what that tasted like, what that felt like, can't have it in the house. And to be able to overcome that. You know, what's, uh, you know what's hard too, Anthony, is that I'm sure you've experienced it since, you know, since you've adopted this lifestyle, is the hardest thing is seeing friends and particularly loved ones who don't understand and who are facing a, a serious medical problem and think there's no choice. Um, the, I, I have an aunt, I always remember my aunt Gladys, my mom's sister, both of whom lived till 97 and they were like two peas in a pod. They would call each other at eight o'clock every night to talk to each other and support each other. And aunt Gladys, 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, um, was diagnosed with a lump on her breast. 
and wouldn't even think about another alternative, just went immediately got a mastectomy. That's heartbreaking. Mm. And we all see it. And my mother used to say, my late great mother used to say that sometimes the hardest people to convince are those closest to you. And it's so heartbreaking when you watch that because you know it's so unnecessary. Right. And they think that what we're doing is extreme, but like what Caldwell Esselstyn says is it's extreme to go on a whole food plant-based diet, but it's not extreme to have your chest ripped open and, and have bypass surgery and, or, or be hooked up for dialysis. That's not extreme, but ours is extreme, but it is hard. And it's, it's just hard when it's your kid, when it's your parent, when it's your you know, a loved one or your friend, and you know this need not be. Right. It really is. You can. The body has amazing abilities to recover itself, but we're so conditioned. Plus, it also here. speaks to, the, to that craving that you have from these foods, these addictive foods. That is a big part of why people just can't seem to overcome. Well, it's also the conditioning. What I'm saying is I think it's also the conditioning that we have of, you know, kind of the medical model in which the world lives. That yeah. if you got a headache, it's not because of something you ate or something, some deficiency in your diet. It's just something you just take a pill. You got indigestion, you take an antacid. Yeah. You got your thyroid is starting to get compromised. So you take thyroxin or have it removed and, and go on thyroxin. And that's okay. Or you did it. They're making it so easy to test your sugar into these pins. You don't even have to prick yourself anymore. You can, They've made it, we've made it all so, um, so convenient, so, so acceptable, uh, but it's hard, especially when the more dramatic things come. Um, I just had a, I had a friend of mine who called me that, uh, that he has a niece who's two-year-old was just diagnosed with leukemia, mm. two years old. Yeah. And, and maybe, again, you know, we're becoming a sicker and sicker society. And maybe this is for one kid where, you know, this is just too late, too little, too late. But we know, we know they demonstrated like Dr. McDougall and Dr. Lim and, 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 uh, and Dr. Barnard and, and Dean Ornish and that the body has an amazing capacity. We have an amazing ability not only to prevent these things from happening, but to reverse these conditions. But it's a matter of trust. It's a mindset. It's a belief. And so many people are just conditioned to, 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 to this is just what you have to do. And, and God forbid you get the C word. I just interviewed Chris Work on a, we have a Power Your Health Q&A, one of the other benefits of the NHA. Once a month, we have this Power Your Health Q&A that's free. You don't have to be a member of the NHA to just get it. Just sign up for it. And I interviewed Chris Work, and he said, you know, cancer is one of those things. Chris beats cancer. If you ever interview Chris, he's an amazing guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and Chris says, cancer is just different. People get it, and everybody just goes in the mortal fear that somehow cancer is just different. Yeah, diabetes, you know, maybe we can reverse my diabetes. Maybe we can, my heart disease, yeah, we can, we can, we can overcome my, diabetes, my heart disease, my hypertension. But cancer? It's different. But right. Chris is here to say, and Alan Goldhammer, all the other people say, it's just another manifestation of bad living, that the body has an amazing ability to recover if, if you don't let it go too far. Right. And then and that's even when, it, when you when let it, it go too far, there's some amazing recoveries because the body's an amazing thing. Yeah. And then this gets into having informed con consent and understanding all that is going to happen here, like the medications that you're going to be on, the surgery that, that, that you're going to have. What are the chances? The what are, what are the odds? You know, look at the diet. What are the, you know, how does the diet, how can the diet help? You know, maybe you do have some surgery. Maybe you do have some kind of, some kind of a limited thing, but then you know that you've got a diet here that can maybe you know, you don't have to worry about taking a pill for five or so years. You know, I've, I've heard of people who have had cancer and they have to stay on a, a pill for a number of years. And, you know, people just, I'm not trying to tell people what they have to do, but understanding things, trying to get information instead of just throwing everything out the window and just uh, saying, okay, we have to do this. We have to do this. Um, there's a little bit more to it. I know what Dr. Gold, Goldhammer is saying, what they're finding is that even at True North, the people even with cancer, 
that, and they're taking chemotherapy and things like that, that, that adopting this kind of diet helps them to function better, mm -hmm. less reactions, things like that. They tolerate it better on these kind of diets. And so, you know, again, it's a, that's the wonderful thing about it. It's a diet for all reasons and all seasons and all conditions. And, and uh, that's the beautiful thing about it. It, 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 it is, doesn't come in a pill, doesn't come in a bottle, doesn't come with a scalpel. And, and you're right too, that, um, that, you know, not to say that modern medicine doesn't have its place. You have a blockage or someplace, you know, you got to get it removed sometimes. You have, like I did, a, you know, a, a tooth that, you know, became uh, 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 obsessed or whatever it is. You got to take it out, but then leave, live even more healthy when you're done. You know, let them do the procedure. Take, take the Novocaine, take the antibiotic to, to get through whatever that period is. And then get yourself healthier. Right. The prescription is the same. The approach is the same. Mm -hmm. That's the beautiful thing about it. Yep. Now, Mark, before I let you go and we wrap up, I have to ask you about how you went from raw to cooked and what that experience was and what, what was it that was your, I don't know if it, if it was a fear or what was keeping you back from going down the cooked. Well, I got to tell you, I think fear was a little bit of it. Um, I had never had something hot in my mouth. The closest thing I ever had to having something hot in my mouth was that I was a theater major in college. In my senior year at the University of Pittsburgh, I did a play called uh, The Country Wife. I had the starring role of Master Horner in the restoration comedy. And it was a three and a half hour play. And I was on stage almost all the time. And on the Saturday night of one of the last performances, I was losing my voice. And so what's the remedy? I couldn't, I wouldn't do any drugs. I wouldn't do ether or any of those things. So the solution, the closest thing I got was hot water, lemon juice, and a little bit of honey. And so off stage, they would have a pot for me and I'd come on and I'd, and it would kind of open up my throat a little bit and all that. But even there, I never drank tea. I never drank coffee. And so the idea of taking something really hot into my mouth was just, was just weird and uncomfortable. And um, so it's just not something I was used to. I also did in the back of my mind had a little fear that this pure temple that I'd grown up with without vaccines and without drugs and without aspirin and all these things and without cooked foods, even cooked natural foods, what would, what would happen? Would I have, would my body rebel in some way um, that could be problematic? So I, I worried about it and I would dialogue from time to time with Alan Goldhammer and Joel Furman. And about it. They didn't think so, but hey, that's, they don't have to live. I have to live with, with me. Um, the secret desire I always had is that I've always been 120, 125 pounds most of my life. And I thought, well, the good news is if I started eating baked potatoes and corn on the cob and split pea soup and things like that, maybe I'd gain 10 pounds. And I'd love that. I mean, it'd be great. You know, put on a little more padding, you know, as we get older. But it was more fear um, and more, yeah, I, I think anxiety about it a little bit. So the, the short story long is that I was, uh, I was a world traveler. And, and I happened to be on a vacation in Rome. And um, this was, well, I'm 70. So this was, I was 32 and a half years old. And um, so what I did whenever I traveled um, is that I always had a little brown bag with an apple and a banana and my cashews and raisins. And that's just what I did. And oftentimes when I travel, if I was in a warmer climate, there was always a fruit stand or a, something that I could get a glass of orange juice or I could do something. But on this particular day, we went from uh, Rome, where we were staying, to Naples, to the Isle of Capri, to, to, to uh, I think to the Isle of Capri, Pompeii, the Isle of Capri. It was a long day. And I, it was a hot day, and I ran out of food. And there were no, just didn't happen to run, get lucky to run across all these things. So it's now, I probably ran out maybe two o'clock in the afternoon, and it's about seven o'clock at night, and we're on the bus coming back to Rome. And they stopped at an Italian restaurant for dinner. And there was nothing for me. If I ate a baked potato, I could add a baked potato. Nobody eats a raw potato. So there was no, right. no option that way. Green beans. I didn't eat raw green beans. They had cooked green beans, but they were also cooked. They had a salad, but you know, Italians like vinegar and oil and things like that. And by that time, I wasn't using, I was trying to avoid that. So there was really nothing. 
And that night I, I came back, I was hungry and I thought, you know, am I doing this for 32 and a half years? Because I think, um, uh, because it's, it's, am I doing it because it's the only thing I know? Or am I doing it because I think it's some necessity for my life? And I knew from having, again, being good friends, close friends with Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer and that, these people all said that, you know, while raw foods and live foods should be the dominant part of your diet, it's tough to sustain yourself on a raw food diet. It's tough for, and I, that was my observation too, with people trying to adopt that later in life. There are raw foodists that, you know, think this is an ethic in and of itself. And they do that and they have trouble sustaining it. And so that was the conclusion I came to myself is that I'm really only doing it because it's the only thing I know and maybe a little bit of anxiety of what would happen if I did. But I decided when I came home, nobody else, I didn't know anybody else like me in the world that was 32 and a half years old, had been on raw foods their whole life. So I just decided when I came home, I would have some of my mother's great wild rice and a baked potato and some corn on the cob. And one of the startling revelations that I had was just kind of silly when you think about it, but for me, it wasn't that you don't have to put something in your mouth scalding hot. You could let it cool off a little bit. So I did. And I always with my avocado and I had a baked potato and I had some corn on the cob and, and I had some of my mother's wild rice and vegetables. And I loved it. It always smelled good to me. It always looked good to me. I loved it. And the only change that's really taken place since then, I didn't gain those 10 pounds, is that it did change my tastes, my orientation in terms of satiation. So if I don't have some slip pea soup or a baked potato or a yam or, or something like that after dinner, I'm hungry. That's changed. And I do look forward to that. Um, I'm still really clean. I mean, I, I don't, you know, this is a world where vegan pizzas, and vegan lasagnas and veggie burgers and things like that. You know, I, the lenses, again, the odd lenses through which I see the world is if I didn't eat a regular burger, <laughs> I eat a veggie burger. If I didn't eat a pizza, what's the novelty of a pizza? I'm just not personally, I've tried it, I've had it, but my tastes are much simpler than that. I prefer a split pea soup. I prefer a Japanese yam with some avocado. And, and you know, and, and my wife makes some pretty good veggie lasagnas and things like that. But if I had the choice, I'd have my, just my steamed vegetables and a baked potato and a yam and wild rice, and quinoa, and things like that. So that's the story how I lost my virginity at 32 and a half years old. And <laughs> entered the world of eating cooked foods and, and cooked and did you Did you see any, was, was, was there any change in like your energy levels that, that you well, noticed? I or? would say, I, you know, again, that's a little bit funny, but I would say that eating a, when I would eat my salad at night and that's all I had at night, man, I'm rip roaring ready to go. When you eat a cooked meal and that at night, you slow down for a little while. I, I, I sit and watch with my mother who lived with us for eight years after my father died. We'd, we'd watch Jeopardy together. <laughs> we'd play cards at seven o'clock at night. And then, you know, then, but subtle change. I mean, I energy wise, I'm a, I'm a, Probably if I violate one health principle that I'm aware of and constantly trying to change is that I'm, I work too much. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm involved in lots of things in the community, not just the NHA, but I run a magistrate's association. I do mediations and things like that. And so there's only so many hours in a day. So I tend to be a night owl and I tend to work late and I get up early. And when I get up early, boy, I'm you know, at a certain point at night, I'll kind of run out of gas but boy when I wake up in the morning I'm rip and ready to go but I need to get that balance better I am trying to do what Joel Furman suggests about intermittent fasting that don't eat past six o'clock at night yeah yeah and that's what I do that discipline and and again we can all try to do better yeah and the older you get the more disciplined I think you have to to be yeah. at least I think I should be so yeah. that's something that I'm working on trying to balance better. Um, but energy wise, in answer to your question, adding some cooked foods into my diet hasn't materially changed. Um, yeah. And I don't think, um, um, you know, they say as you get older, you, you want to be careful, keep your mind active. 
for Alzheimer's issues and all that. <laughs> My mind stays very active. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I play ping pong and I work out with weights. And I like to take dogs for walks and stuff like that. So well, I was going to ask you when, yeah. when, when you were doing the raw foods, did you get hungry a lot? Did you find yourself getting hungry or, or were you active? Because the more active you are, you have to have a lot more calories. Like what, how did I, you I, do I, it? I can't really, I can't really explain that. I, I can't really explain that except that I never remember being hungry. Hmm. I would have what I had every day. I'd have my nuts and, and, and you know, my, my orange juice and nuts for breakfast and ground up nuts and my orange juice and that. I'd have a big salad and, and some avocado and dates and things like that for lunch. And my dinner was a salad and, and uh, you know, lots of avocado and English people. I, I just don't ever remember really being hungry. It's what I look forward to. I think, I think maybe there's an expectation of it all. Again, what you... What you think you need is what you need. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought I needed. And so I was always, uh, I, I think if people, uh, if family members, if you'd ask that question of family members, they would always say that I was always a energizer bunny, bunny kind of guy, always doing stuff, always moving. And, and um, that hasn't really changed very much. Wow. The years. Well, you, you are an inspiration. I mean, you know, I don't know if uh, a lot of people are suddenly going to go raw after seeing this, but they don't I, have I to. I wouldn't tell them to go raw. Well, I and, and they don't have to. I, mean, there's I would a say lesson. raise your kids. If you have the privilege yeah. of raising kids together, expose them. Get yeah. those tastes oriented to strawberries and peas and, and, and cantaloupe and mangoes and pineapples so that whatever other things they do, they don't, the, the memory, the, the, the uh, taste memories are there. Yeah. Do that. But um, but they don't have to go raw. But certainly make sure that you get a lot of live foods into your diet. If you're adopting a whole food, plant-based diet, put the emphasis on the whole food, the whole plants. Right. Do that. The more right. Joel Furman, make your salad your main meal and then do all the other stuff. And right. you'll not only hedge your bed, if weight is your issue, you'll never have a weight problem if you load up on your salad. Mm -hmm. it just won't happen because you won't have room for all the rest. Right. And I, and I think it all gets back to eating the way our body is naturally meant to be. I mean, the, the way it's designed and the more that you can get in alignment there, I think the more benefits that you will see time and time again, testimonial. I show testimonials every day on my <laughs> Facebook page. And it's one after another of people doing this exact thing. They're getting away from the standard American diet. And it's no coincidence that the standard American diseases go away too. Uh, and they, they start to gravitate and get a lot more healthier and their body adapts. And uh, it's, it's just, I, I just, I see it over and over. And this ties into what I was talking about before with all of these plant-based doctors and all the results that they get. They've been, they've been doing it for decades with the same kind of approach. And Cam were found in the China study. These countries, until they adopted, you know, the Western diet, until yeah. they adopted our, our diet, they didn't have heart disease. They didn't have prostate problems. They didn't have cancer rates. And that's Why crazy to think about. It's crazy to think about, but it's true. So yeah. Statistically, it's true. Historically, yeah. it's true. And again, you know, it just sort of makes sense. Can I, can I read you one quote? Because it's my favorite quote. I don't know. Sure. I, don't, I don't think I ever did. I'm going to do this often. But one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the books I told you about on the history of the natural hygiene movement is this one called The Greatest Health Discovery. Um, natural hygiene is kind of where people that inspired my family and where I come from and what inspired Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer. So the people that inspired them were these 18th to 19th century thinkers like Russell Tracker Trawl and Isaac Jennings and Mary Gove and real health reformers. Russell Trawl has a quote that I've always liked that I read all the time. He says, and this applies to the whole food plant-based diet system, which we, you and I champion now. He says the system, which he lived from 1812 to 1877, a prolific writer on, on, all, on, all this, on this way of living. He said, the system which we endorse and practice is true in harmony with nature, in accordance with the laws of the vital organism, correct in science, sound in philosophy, in agreement with common sense, successful in results and a blessing to mankind hmm. yeah. that is it yeah capsulize it all it just happens to work for the planet 
happens to work for our body. It happens to work in common sense. It's it's uh, it's a blessing of this way. Yeah, living. seems like there's and a lot. He was of... saying that in the 1870s. Yeah, it, he was talking 1870s, about 1870s, not 1970s. 1870s. 1870s. Harmony, yeah. harmony with nature, harmony with the foods, the way that we health absorb results, the foods. Healthful living. Yeah, I mean, this is living in harmony with nature. Healthcare yeah. is self care. The yeah. one you said in the little intro about it, health is built, not bought. Health is built, not bought. Yeah, and you are a great example of that. And I want to thank you, Mark, for uh, coming on. Hopefully, we get and to meet uh, when when I'm going down to Virginia to visit the family. We'll make a point to drive through Lexington. Sure. Yeah, and you know, one one thing I just want to say to all my followers: thank you, by the way, for offering them a free issue. So you just have to email me at mhuberman at healthscience.org. I'll or go put to that up. Healthscience.org, and I'll send them a. I want to show them this is I don't normally promote books or magazines or you know anything really in terms of products but uh, this here is a fantastic magazine and I'm not just saying that like Mark says 40 pages wall to wall no ads it is whole food plant based you know so if you're out there thinking well there's no magazine that's really geared towards whole food no this this is whole food plant based interviews you know mark it almost feels like the facebook page that i have the vital blend this almost seems like a magazine version of it because it's you know what interviews recipes information test testimonials it's all this in written form and it's quality and uh i can't recommend it more so uh if you want to have a magazine that's geared towards whole food plant-based health science is it and i want to thank you for making that offer to all my followers my pleasure mark huberman it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you so much and uh, hopefully we will meet again all right so we meet and, again. Uh, before i do let you go let me know and my followers and everybody out out there where we can find you anything that you want to plug in terms of sure. the health science our, our website is healthscience.org we just launched a brand new website and even the magazine that you saw was just redesigned it's got we got new designers and all wow. that it's better than ever um so you go to our website healthscience.org you can sign up you can register for our 2022 conference june 24th to the 26th in cleveland where again, uh, you know, you won't find a better lineup of speakers. Uh, you won't find it at a more affordable price. You won't find better meals and you'll be in a community of like-minded people. And uh, it doesn't get any better than that. And thank God, thank God that this kind of COVID nightmare that we've all been living with for so very long, at least for now, and at least for the reasonable future, seems like it's settled down. So people are more comfortable traveling and mask mandates and vaccine passports and all that sort of stuff. It's, sort of died down. So I think we're going to be back to uh, the good old days of coming together for conferences. And we're really looking forward to that. And for people that can't come, we're going to offer a, a virtual option that people will be able to live stream it. Uh, we did that last year. We had over 700 people from a whole bunch of different countries. And we made that real affordable. So you watch for our website and you'll see that as well. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you. Indeed.